Okay, so we welcome to the lightning talk session. The speakers have five minutes. I kick them off if they take long. Everyone's good. Here we go. Awesome. Okay, so my name is Pai Dalford, and I'm here to speak not about Python, but about Haskell, um, but with a perspective of what makes this language interesting for Python users. Um, so, how many of you know about Haskell at all? Okay, so there's quite a bit. Uh, so Haskell is a purely functional programming language. Um, it has a rich history, it's just about as old as Python, and um, it's a language that Python has a really kind of like learned and borrowed a lot from. So you might be familiar with this comprehension. That's something that Python pretty much took directly from Haskell. Um, things like the operations protocol, generators, um, obviously functional features like lambda and closures and lexical scope. These are all things that Python takes from functional programming languages um, like Haskell and related languages. So it's really like a rich field that uh, Python has borrowed from. So it's to investigate. Um, so one of the first distinctive features of Haskell is that it's lazy evaluated, so unlike Python, which is strictly evaluated. So what this means is that um, you can, for example, have infinite data structures. Uh, like here, you're actually defining an infinite list in Haskell, um, which is a lot like generators in Python, but it's actually a data structure that only gets evaluated um, as much as you use. So you can take 10 elements from this list, They'll only calculate that those 10 elements, but the list is actually infinite. So you can keep on consuming it for as long as you want to. Um, and it's not just like generators in Python, because you might think this is not impressive, it's just you know, what you can do with Python generators. But in Haskell, everything works like this. So you can, for example, have an infinite tree. If any of you have a mathematical background, you might know the stern Brokaw tree. Um, it's a way to enumerate rational numbers, but it's an infinite tree starting from a single node and just going infinitely um, in all directions. And this is an example of it, where this is now cut off to three levels, but this whole tree actually goes on infinitely. You can write tree traverse algorithms that work with this tree just as if it's actually all there, but Haskell will only evaluate what you actually use. So, um, yeah, the second thing that uh, comes up with Haskell that's different to Python is that there's no side effects. This is what's meant with Haskell being a purely functional language. So, instead of side effects, you have first class effects. So you might know that in Python, many things are first class, but effects aren't. In Haskell, um, an action like doing get line or printing something, these are actually IO actions, which are values which you can manipulate and um, pass around and uh, combine, just like any other effect. Um, and there's an example of like defining some effects, composing them together, and then at the end there, taking an effect and replicating it five times, just like you would replicate something five times in the list. And um, this is like a whole way of working with effects that you don't really often get in Python. There's some libraries like this, but um, yeah, it's, it's a really cool part of Haskell. Um, so at the heart of Haskell is algebraic data types. This is another thing that Python has relatively poor support for, but that Python could actually really use. Now, algebraic data types in Haskell are really core. It's um, uh, like you define a data type in terms of its constructors, and you define computations in terms of how they destructure. So you have this duality <coughs> of construction and consumption, which drive the evaluation of Haskell programs in a really beautiful way, which you can't really express in Python very well or very clearly. It's like this yin yang loop. Um, in, uh, in Haskell, even though it's a strongly typed language, you can actually, a lot of the time it feels like working in Python, where <coughs> it's very loosely typed. Uh, where Python has duct typing and interfaces, which you're all familiar with. In Haskell, you have type classes which express certain abstractions, like there's an example of a number where you have a certain interface, you have different implementations for different types, and you can have generic functions across this. So you can write generic code and polymorphic code without actually caring too much about the de details, much as you would in Python. So you can see these are some examples of type classes in Haskell. You can see they do pretty much the same thing as Python does, um, with magic methods, with the double underscore functions, with the protocols that Python has. Um, but in, in, in Haskell, these are first class concepts which you can do a lot more with. Um, one of the cool features of the Haskell type system, which a lot of people don't appreciate, is that it's not a bondage and discipline thing, it's a way of actually proving things about your program, uh, expressing your problem domain um, in a way that makes more sense for your program. So here's an example of where you can take let's say a building type like double, and refine it to Celsius and Fahrenheit. And 
you can make unit conversion explicit so that it's impossible for you to mix up your units. And this is something that you can't easily do in Python. Uh, but in Haskell, you can express this and you can make the, you can make mixing up your units a compile time error with no runtime cost. It's like all of this happens purely in compile time. And it doesn't stop there. You can actually do type level programming in Haskell, um, which is another thing that uh, I would really like to see in Python. Um, you can encode things like algorithmic invariants. If you're familiar with red black trees, you can have a red black tree balance condition encoded at the type level so that if you mess up your algorithm, you get a type error, not a runtime error. You can encode things like business logic, like checking where the streams are escaped, where the users are logged in or not at a certain point. You can make those type level checks instead of runtime checks. And this is like a really amazing thing that you don't even realize is possible until you've kind of like actually touched on it in this context. Um, and then finally, lastly, to just another example of the kind of like type level hackery you can do in Haskell. Um, in the IRC channel, there's Lambda Bot, one of the modules it has is this thing called Jimmy, where you can actually give it a type signature and it generates an implementation of that type. Uh, type. Yes. And that's it. So, yeah. <laughs> Summary, Haskell is really cool, and if you like Python, it's a really cool language to check out. So, yeah, check it out. Something like this. 
and then these are your options over here. You can pass in and you can use your options, of course, as seen earlier. And then you can just do a select style from your CSV, uh, from your fun table, and you can get the data in your Excel form. So, as you can see, the total lines of Python goes about three, four lines, and your SQL was about three statements there. Um, so what else? You can put your ORM on top of it, um, you can put your BI tool, you can put your kitchen sink above it, you know what it does, right? Um, if you have a, a Postgres uh, 9.3 uh, uh, plus, you can even do inserts, updates, and deletes. Uh, there's quite a few uh, fun data wraps that are out there. There's uh, fun data wraps that you can do SQL for me, um, all that, uh, Docker, even a, a, there's a PG OS query, which is basically like a Facebook OS query, but within Postgres. Um, and then there's also uh, the latest foreign data wrapper, among the foreign data wrapper, and there's much more on the Postgres Java wiki. Okay, so I think I'm about this. So yeah, I'm from um, SKSA, um, the control and monitoring team. Uh, what we do is our use case is that we um, have to archive our data to some file, and we archive it to like an um, HDF file, and have some legacy archive files to CCSV files, which is like an internal format. So we query these files via server, um, we use Postgres uh, foreign data wrapper to represent it in the table. So it's uh, time series data, um, and that's basically the form with, with the unique uh, sample keys. Um, so what we liked about it, it's an SQL interface, it remains the same, right? Uh, it's one interface for curing multiple data sources. Um, so they should have a uh, file format and then have CCSV format, and we also have a file of SQL, so you can look other kind of reporting things you would like to do. Um, what I do not like about it, um, some writing some unit tests for the foreign data wrapper is a bit tricky sometimes. Uh, but you can get over that. And then the future, <laughs> uh, we actually plan to remove the uh, HDF files and the other legacy files and then put some CF uh, that also distributed objects so we then still create it via Postgres and interface. So the interface remains the same, um, this core interface. And then your requirements for just basic selecting, um, just select, uh, you need Postgres uh, 9.1 plus, you need the development packages, the Python development packages, uh, Python 2.7 or 3.3, and then also we are hiding.
which will hopefully be solved soon. There's a lightning talk at the end of the session where the video team will explain why this happened. <laughs>
supporting about 300 users around the country. Okay, so this is the place for researchers who need big computing to come to. Um, in our, our new facility, there are over uh, 24,000 cores. We have five large memory machines, some test bed hardware stuff, some so-called big data facilities, big storage facilities, and it's, it's ranked 121 in the top 500, if that's the kind of thing you care about. Um, and we spent quite a bit of time on some training and development. So. Okay, so the users in many, many fields, health, mining, construction, energy, weather, film, finance, astronomy. Um, ask me about that later if you're interested. It's molecular modeling, there's bioinformatics, there's image processing, lots of simulation. Um, but the kind of thing I do is more related to the, the square kilometer array. Who has heard of the square kilometer array? Who has not heard of the square kilometer array? <laughs> so, so South Africa is spending 20% of our science and technology budget on astronomy. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Um, we, it's, so the Square Kilometer Array is a, a billion dollar telescope for, tw for uh, after 2020. Really. Starting being built now, so in phase one, 200 dishes in South Africa, plus an array in Australia, but then in phase two, there'll be a tenor in eight other African countries, okay? So, yeah, the first, like I say, the first dishes are up near Carnarvon, and um, there's been, the, the first images have been taken. And you can see the eight countries where the um, other antenna will go. So the SKA is a massive computing challenge. The SKA on its own, the data is more than 10 times our current global internet traffic. Okay, it's big data. Okay, but it's also a long time in the future. Maybe it's not so big then when you actually finish. Um, and there are just so many levels of data crunching. So at the Center for High Performance Computing, we can tackle, we, well, we tackled some of those, not all of them, um, but particularly I work at these, uh, at the, the sort of end there where we do statistical analysis of big catalogs of data. We do big end body simulations so that we can do modeling. You know, there's theory and we've got data and we need to do lots of modeling and stats in between to, to um, decide if your theory actually describes the nature of dark energy or whatever it is you're trying to probe. Um, so the kind of astronomy projects we have, and I think we use Python for all five of these particular things. So Sean is in the audience. He's done, he has his PhDs in these exotic cosmologies and did lots of theoretical calculations. We also do these big simulations where we try and simulate big chunks of the universe and see if we can make galaxies that look like real galaxies. We do quite a bit of data mining, so we take all the data that's from, in these, from these satellites paid for by the rest of the world and extract interesting science. Um, then we, there's quite a lot of, uh, use even our own data with the South African Large Telescope. We do models fitting and stats and data mining, more model fitting. And you'll see these two last students here come from Madagascar and Mauritius, which are two of the SKA countries. So we've had a big influx of students from these countries. In fact, that's what I spend quite a bit of my time doing is this kind of computing development in the rest of Africa. So if you're from any of the eight countries listed there, you could have access to free hardware and training um, as part of our SKA readiness projects. You also have access to CHPC um, facilities. Um, and <coughs> my summary, where uh, the, so the CHPC is our national supercomputing facility, big computers, uh, lots of applications. Um, the SKA is a huge radio telescope that is centered in South Africa, but will have um, parts in the rest of Africa. We're tackling lots of astro projects using Python. Um, the CHPC is doing computing development in the rest of Africa, and. Please contact me if you're interested in any of these things, like um, 
playing around with the biggest computer in Africa. It's kind of cool. Or solving the mysteries of the universe. Okay, that's also something we do. And if you're interested in working in the, in the other parts of Africa, perhaps, or you come from other parts of Africa, I'd be ready to get here. I'm going to read it there and like you can listen. Um, you've maybe heard of the video stuff, you've probably maybe heard of us. The five W's and the one H, can you jump in? Drop my level a little bit because I'm echoing. Um, so what is it? Why? When? Where? Who? And how? What is it? It's recording all talks. It's recording all talks done here in the three main rooms. <laughs> And we also get the slides through this magical little box down here that I'll tell you more about shortly. It's N720p, which I note because that's not a thing that actually happens generally. Usually it's kind of like analog video signals and VGA connectors, and that's just hard to do. Or a camera pointed at the screen. Yes, that too. Lighting on that is hell. So why do we do this? Because we've got some really cool talks, we've got some really great speakers, and you know, more than just these people want to be able to hear them because they can't make it whether time, distance, ticket availability, or anything else. And, of course, we can put them on the internet. It's not an exhaustive list. If there are more reasons, feel free to find them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when we're basically all the talks, I don't believe we've missed a single talk today. Um, that does sometimes happen. We do sometimes lose talks. We haven't. Um, and, uh, hang on, my firewall keeps shouting at me. <laughs> Um, when and where, all the main talk and tutorial rooms, not all the open spaces and such. Equipment availability, the stuff costs money, that's basically the main limitation. Um, who? A whole bunch of people, and thank you to those people that we suckered <coughs> into doing stuff. Um, <laughs> there's a couple of you. The people that you know, Stefano there, you see Barefoot Hippie running around. <laughs> there's Potter Trucker, Kyle there in the corner. There's Graham. Where's Graham? Where are you hiding? Maybe he's getting coffee or something. Um, there's Sukello. Where's Sukello? There, by the camera. And then there's me. Hello. Um, how are we doing this? This is actually the fun part. So there's a bit of setup involved. There's a bit of equipment involved. There's a lot of wire involved. And there's a couple of adapters. Roughly, the model is based on what was used at DevConf. It's the third one of these that I have personally worked on. It's about the fifth that you've done, I think. I just lost track. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of stuff. There's a projector, there's a screen, there's a lectern, this is the lectern, there's video feeds out, there's presenter laptop, and then there's a couple of, there's like a small computer in here next to the other small computer. There's cables everywhere. Um, then there's the other page that's got all the audio stuff that also gets into this. All of this outputs an IP video feed that goes to a switch and a computer over there. That in turn receives a cross mix of both this feed <coughs> and the camera over there. We can live mix all of that stuff on there 
in picture in picture mode, side by side picture mode, full screen on the two plus feeds. We're just doing two feeds, we can do more. Also audio cross mixing, there's a lot of stuff happening over there. And the people that do that and don't freak out, like give them an applause later or give them a beer, one of the two works. Like that, seriously, there's a lot. There's five audio channels that they have to care about. There's all the feedback. This room is very echoey. There's the video feed itself. There's people's slides. I can just like do this thing and not tell him that I'm going to do it. He has to keep track of that. It's, it's, the people that do that, like really, they do well. The core of the IT stuff is a thing called Voxomix. Thank you for the Germans, uh, CCC, that started doing that development. They started doing that because they wanted something digital and IT based. That's the URL. The other one's actually a clickable URL, but you can't see it. Um, the board in here, what I'm briefly referred to, is a thing from Tim Video's project. Tim is this guy in Australia that had a lot of money to show his stuff, and he built this stuff, and he funded some development, and then uh, that's URL for him. And this board takes in HDMI connectors, and now outputs HDMI, and outputs IP video over MJPEG, because everything's terrible, and so there's an actual reason. One of the video outputs is a USB 2 feed. And it looks like a webcam. Like if you plug this thing into something, it looks like a webcam. The reason for this is USB 2 has a speed limit. Can anyone here tell me what the speed limit is? Okay. What is a 720 video feed like? 860 megabits. So what do we do? We make it look like MJPEG and that saves a lot. Like a lot, actually. And I think that brings the size down to about seven. Um, what goes wrong with this? Chromebooks don't like the video modes that this board can do. Rebooting the board is sometimes needed, as you saw twice in the last 30 minutes. Mode differences between outputs. Um, there's a lot of video mode outputs. There's a lot of modes that your laptop can or can't do. Finding the right intersections there is tricky. These things aren't documented anywhere. Um, <laughs> VGA, yes, in 2016, some people still have VGA. We haven't had any yet. No, not at this conference, but it is still a thing on new laptops even. Um, different GPUs in your MacBook or your laptop has two different modes, even some of the cheaper laptops. The video on your one adapter is a different video interface to the other output. It, it, it happens. Um, what else goes wrong? Software happens. Uh, we get random UI stalls. FFmpeg just <coughs> stops writing stuff to disk. Why? If you know why, please tell us. We would like to know. Um, other recording pipelines aren't as well tested. We can't use <coughs> the other one today because libav has a different symbol reference and it just isn't there. Um, the capture board that I, I already mentioned that looks like a webcam and firmware. So the, this firmware is actually the one that we used in Pi, Ohio a couple months back. Why we're using it? it? We made it work there and we didn't want to touch it. <laughs> so <laughs> it kind of works. There's a much newer version. There, there is. We don't know if it works. We, this works. Are we done yet? No, we're not. Power can trip. Fortunately, we haven't had that. We had a very good event in this kind of thing. Audio levels. Echo in the room, voices echoing, that kind of thing. Camera bumps. Um, someone stands up, backpacks and oops, there goes the feed. There goes the camera. This just stuff happens. Batteries. <laughs> Batteries. <laughs> this room got hit once, I believe, already. Any of the other rooms? Anyone know? Okay. Yes. Cool. Batteries happen. Someone's laptop didn't work, we had to drop a desktop for video. It's like this just stuff happens. Running out of volunteers. Like we have only so many people, it needs two to three people per room. Now I would like to point out, as Stefano mentioned, he's got 20 of these adapters that he's tried to do to find the way to do this accurately, okay? Sometimes this happens. <laughs> and this is the one that works, <coughs> okay? The fact that any of this stuff works is sometimes a small miracle, but yeah. The outcome of it is you can see the videos on the internet, right? So you can share these things with other people, and it's, it's cool. And we would like to do more of them. So please help us if you can. That's it.